Um, so welcome all to uh, Football Fridays at the EC, the On the Sideline series. I'm Lisa Hemming, your Academic Programs Director for the Alumni Association. So our area handles all of our academic and intellectual engagement online, specifically uh, on campus in our community. So Hesburgh Lectures, we do a teaching conference, we have five new online learning series, as well as a Football Friday series. And today we are honored to host the talk, Her Loyal Daughters and Sons, exploring the rich history of Notre Dame's black student experience. So in the new book, here I'm gonna be Vanna, The Black Domer, Seven Years at Notre Dame, editors Don Winecliffe and David Krashna have assembled a compelling collection of 70 essays and profiles and experiences of black students at Notre Dame. Both Don Winecliffe and David Krashna are here today along with first year studies Dean Hugh Page. We're excited about this fascinating discussion about some of the personal stories and the larger overview of the evolving black student experience at Notre Dame over the last 70 years. So now for brief introductions. So Don Winecliffe, class of 69, came here from Terre Haute, Indiana. He majored in government. It was involved in student government and efforts to recruit black students here at Notre Dame. After graduation and attending graduate school for a brief time, he began a career as a journalist and 35 years later became a journalism professor at Loyola University in Chicago and former editor, page editor of the Chicago Tribune. So welcome, Don. So David Krashna, class of 71, is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. During his time here at Notre Dame, he became the first black student body president. After graduation, he earned his law degree from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's currently practicing, and he's right now the Superior Court Judge of Alameda County in California and a law professor. And on to Reverend Hugh Page. He's a, uh, currently the Associate Professor of Theology and Africana Studies, as well as Vice President, Associate Provost, and Dean of the First Year Studies. At, he's an Episcopal priest. Dean Page chose a bachelor's in history from Hampton University. I have to read all of this. So very impressive. Master's degrees from G, uh, the General Theological Seminary in New York, a doctorate of ministry from the Graduate Theological Foundation, and master's and doctoral degrees in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from Harvard. So it's impressive. And my favorite part when I pulled up his bio was he's a poet, musician, photographer, martial artist, and a certified tennis professional. And he strives to live according to the Renaissance ideal of broad learning and full engagement in life. So I think he does a great job at that. Well, my friends, I give all honor, praise, and thanks to God. And we'd like to welcome you, Don Wycliffe and I, to our book presentation, Black Domers, 70 Years at Notre Dame. Now, Lisa, somewhere are my notes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the fellow with the afro with Father Hesburgh is yours truly. OK, all right. <laughs> Thank you to the national, uh, the national Notre Dame Alumni Association. Lisa Hemming, thank you so much for putting this together. Richard Ryans, you are the man. Would you stand up? Would you stand up? Yes. He's our president of the uh, black alumni of Notre Dame, a gentleman who could not join us. He lives in Lake uh, Forest, Illinois. Ron Irvine, class of 73. If you follow our Facebook page, he is the creator. Donna didn't, uh, I did not ask him to do it. He, he just did it, and he, it's marvelous. So if you want to follow us on Facebook. We would like to acknowledge the uh, Black Domers team, our publisher, Jim Langford of Corby Books. Jim, would you stand up, please? All right. And Jim, you keep telling us you have a number of books in the Notre Dame bookstore. We, that's, that's OK. But your best book is Black Numbers, OK? All right, all right. Just want to make sure you're aware of that, all right? OK. And by the way, the book is available next door. A number of you have it. And uh, I think, well, first of all, how many essayists are in the room? And so you'll know you can get a lot of signatures today if you want. OK, Reggie Brooks, uh, Manny, Richard, Eleanor, Iris, Gina, Schopspot, right? Strathspire, OK. Now, speaking of our team, wow, these people were just absolutely wonderful. Unsolicited, Don, would you say unsolicited? Pam and Gina? I'd say unsolicited. OK, Pam Whitecliffe, would you stand up, please? Did all the administrative work answering all the emails? Yeah. 
help with the editing, everything. And Gina Krasnina saw her at the end of her video. She created the video, took all these old photos, refurbished them, and put them in the video. She also uh, created the front cover of our book. Okay, Gina Krasnina, would you stand up? Black Domers, 70 Years of Notre Dame, celebrates the matriculation of the first African-American student at Notre Dame, Frazier L. Thompson, who came to Notre Dame uh, under a Navy officer training program. He started in 1944, graduated in 1947. So we um, only interviewed two publishers, Corby Books, and another one. We'll leave that to the side for right now. Of course, you're welcome to ask questions at the end. Well, we sat down with Jim, and he said, you know, I love this book. And we said, well, it has to come out in 2014, Jim. You would be able to do that. And we met him in uh, late August of 2013. And Jim said, look, if you get me the manuscript by March 31, 2014, I will ensure that book is out in two, uh, 2014. We got the manuscript to Jim, timely, and we have the book out. It came out in June. Okay, it's uh, available on Amazon.com, next door as well. Okay, let's see. Don and I have agreed to donate all profits from the book to the Fraser L. Thompson Scholarship Fund here at Notre Dame. Also, Don and I want to remind you also, you may not know this, is it St. Augustine or Augustine? Uh, St. Augustine will be there Sunday morning after the 10.30 Mass, uh, signing books there as well. To get you in the spirit of the season, uh, Rice game coming up, the first game of the season, I picked a little passage from one of our essays, Jamie L. Austin, class of 2004. There's something about the fall that makes me think of Notre Dame. Year after year, the colorful trees and the brisk and sunny mornings make me smile and remember what it felt like to walk across the South Quad. I think about those beautiful old trees that shaded the path between the Quad and the Basilica, so rich and full of history. I can recall stopping under the canopy of neighboring trees on my way to Crowley Music Hall as, as if it happened only last week. Occasionally, I just take a break from my busy days, close my eyes, and silently wish that I were walking up Notre Dame Avenue catching a glimpse of a sparkling dome between the trees. For just a moment, it feels so real that I can almost smell the familiar scent of ethanol in the air. <laughs> Without fail, I begin to reminisce about the excitement of football weekends on campus. And before I know it, my heart lets out a great big go Irish. That's from Jamie. And if I could just flip a few pages, one of our essays is here. And I'd like to, uh, well, let me before that, our co-editor from his essay. You know, one of the things Don's going to tell you about is the structure of the book, what we asked each essay is to do. Part of Don's answer uh, to his first question, how do you got to Notre Dame? Short paragraph from his. I did not choose Notre Dame. Rather, Notre Dame happened to me. As suddenly and unexpectedly as that Kansas cyclone happened to Dor Dorothy Gale, the little heroine, of the Wizard of Oz, who found herself swept away from home and over the rainbow. That's from Don Wycliffe. He writes well. Yeah. <laughs> At least that's what he tells me. No, no, he does. He does. <laughs> and then, last of the reading for now, another one of our essays, our, our leader, Richard Ryan's class of 1979. So let me get this straight. You, a black Baptist from the South, are going to a predominantly white Catholic institution in the North? Who does that? It was a question of friends and family alike asked when they heard the news I was going to Notre Dame. Thank you all for coming. I now just so proudly like to introduce the co-editor and the major editor of our book, my friend. We met uh, 40 some years ago in Farley Hall and uh, we've been friends ever since. So we just reconnected in recent years and we have a lot of stories to tell but you don't you didn't come here for that, all right? You came to uh, meet Noel Don Wycliffe, N.D., Noel Don Wycliffe. Don?
Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, those of you who bought the book, thank you for doing so. Those of you who still haven't, I'll thank you for doing it afterwards. <laughs> it was uh, toward the end of last July, I think, that I got an email from David Krashner, with whom I had reconnected uh, just recently. And uh, uh, he, he said, uh, I had a thought while showering this morning. I think it's time there was a history of the black students at Notre Dame done. And I think you're the person to do it. And um, I immediately thought, I've got a day job. <laughs> because at the time, I was uh, still employed as a uh, professor at Loyola. I've since retired. But uh, um, I wrote David back, and I said, I think that's a great idea. Why don't we take this approach? Why don't we? solicit some essays about their Notre Dame experiences by black alumni. That way, I don't have to write everything. And we get some authenticity. And so we set about picking people. Uh, contrary to some people's belief, perhaps, it was not all arbitrary. The arbitrariness came at the end. I'll tell you about that later. But uh, uh, at the beginning, we um, posted notices to uh, all the black alumni asking, who do you think ought to be in a book of this sort? And got nominations. We solicited uh, advice from people like uh, Dan Saraceno, the longtime director of admissions, who has been an enormous help in this, and Mel Tardy in the first year of studies, who is an enormous repository of institutional knowledge. And uh, we came up with about 250 nominations and uh, began whittling that down, trying to get a decent representation from each decade, men, women, old, young, all kinds of things. Um, in the end, we uh, came out with a book with 63 autobiographical essays, that is, pieces written by the actual um, the, the people who uh, experience these things. And then I did an additional seven profiles of uh, deceased alumni, black alumni, who uh, we thought belonged in the book. Uh, could have picked many more, but we were looking for a final figure of 70 to correspond to the 70 years since um, Frazier L. Thompson became the first black student at Notre Dame. Uh, and additionally, I wrote some what we call connective tissue, a little essay at the beginning of each chapter, talking about things that were happening on campus and in the world um, during the particular decade. Um, there were, um, there were uh, a number of themes that developed during, the, uh, during my editing of the book that I could thought I discerned. Uh, one, overall, I would say, no matter what the individuals experience, almost every essay, with maybe a couple of exceptions, ends with, a, with virtually the words of the alma mater. We love the Notre Dame. Grateful for the experience here. And um, I certainly yield to nobody in my gratitude for it. Um, additionally, there were um, two factors that I kept seeing in, in many of the essays, more in the older days than in the, than in the more recent ones. Uh, the Hesburgh factor, I would say, is, is enormous. It is impossible to overstate the importance on the institution and on individuals of Father Theodore M. Hesburgh. People speak of him as um, a counselor, a mentor. He, he gave a personal touch. He was available to people at all hours uh, who needed some bucking up when they had a bad experience, when they were just feeling down and lonely and wondering, did I do the right thing by coming to this place? Uh, that name just resonates throughout the book. Uh, 
Another important theme, and this goes to the very notion of the Notre Dame family, is uh, the importance of personal relationships, particularly with faculty members. Um, interestingly, I was uh, a couple months ago there was an article in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, some research done, I think, at Purdue or someplace, uh, about what makes for success in college is a personal relationship with at least one faculty member. I could name half a dozen of them who in, uh, affected me here. But time and again, over the course of these essays, you see people who developed a close relationship with a faculty member, a mentor, and it was crucial. Um, there were, to pick a favorite is, is almost like saying, which of your children do you love? most, but uh, there were a couple of the essays here that really moved me. One of the things we did at the start of the uh, process was ask everybody to respond to three questions. How did you come to attend Notre Dame? What was your experience like when you were here? And what effect has Notre Dame had in your life since graduation? Um, and Importantly, we emphasized, you do not have to be positive all the time. There is probably nobody who attended this university who doesn't feel at least a little ambiguity about it. So don't hesitate to be critical. Um, nevertheless, as I said, in the end, most people were very positive. But I want to call your attention to one of what I think was one of the best written essays in the book by a... Um, a fellow named John Banks Brooks. He was in the class of 1972. And uh, he wrote about an experience that occurred while he was with the Glee Club traveling through the South in Mississippi. And um, it was a very painful experience for him. He writes, um, um, That night, dressed in tails, looking like high-class penguins, we were putting the finishing touches on a concert somewhere in Mississippi. As a final encore, fellow second tenor Adrian D., what an astounding voice, had a moving solo in a Negro spiritual. The director shot Adrian in, quote, it's showtime look, and then, Announcing the spiritual's name, remarked that it was about, quote, some darkie praying that God would take away his burdens. And John reflects about the effect of that word on him, how powerful it was. And um, he ends with the paragraph, then I thought of my people working the fields that day and realized that I was never really separate and apart from for me, as for them, it was dark in Mississippi, but I was far from home. It was a sad story, very sad story. One of the, one of several in the book. But then there are the other stories, like that of Manny Grace, who is here today. And I was uh, really struck by the ending of his, of his essay. He writes, uh, the next day I was ecstatic to learn that I had been selected to be one of the three new members of the Irish Guard. Whatever concerns I had about being accepted by the other guardsmen proved unfounded. It was simply never an issue with them. Surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, the only adverse reaction I received came from some of my fellow black students at Notre Dame. The majority of my black classmates and there weren't that many of us at the time, thought it was cool. But a small minority of the black students didn't like the idea. Some of the more vocal black students asked me why I wanted to be in the Irish Guard. Wouldn't I feel silly wearing a kilt on a football Saturday? What the hell did the Irish Guard have to do with my culture? Or with football, for that matter? What was I hoping to accomplish? I 
tried to explain that the Irish Guard represented the, the best of the marchers in the Notre Dame band, and I simply wanted to be among the best. After all, there were lots of black players on the fighting Irish football team, and I bet none of them were Irish, fighting or otherwise. <laughs> the football players weren't being accused of, a, of falsely aspiring to be Irish. They were simply doing what they loved and playing for one of the best football teams in the country, which happened to be called the Fighting Irish. Um, there's one other that I'd like to read, but I've already gone on too long. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn this back to David, and I guess Thank we'll you, have Don. question and answers after sure. you. Thank you, Don. Well, there are a number of people throughout the country listening to this presentation since, since it's being live streamed. I want to shout out to my judicial colleague in uh, Oakland, California, Judge Patrick Zika, uh, a good friend of mine, Bill Joyce, who's in the Bay Area, and friends of Gina and myself. Another theme that I saw come out of the book, and by the way, when Don and I, we didn't give him a, we didn't say, we'd like you to develop this theme about Father Hesper, or personal relationships with faculty members. We didn't do any of that. Don told you the three questions we asked people to address, okay? But we got these things, Father Hesper, personal relationships with faculty members, and I saw another one, community service. The number of people who said, Notre Dame affected me, that I wanted to do something for the community, use my skills to the best I can for people in my community. And we have some notable examples of that, and let me see, I have a few of them. Uh, Benita Bradshaw, uh, Christine uh, Swanson, and Lauren and Justin Tuck. Just last year, in the year 2013, they were voted one of the 10 most influential philanthropists in the black community. And they're now in Oakland because Justin now plays for our local team, the Oakland Raiders. Mentors, Don, Don mentioned mentors. A mentor of mine was Father uh, Charles Sheedy because I, I had to, Father Hesburgh sent me throughout the country to recruit for African-American students at one time. I, McKenna, uh, Mark and Maria McKenna, good friends there. And he then gave me, Father Hesburgh did, um, three mentors, I'm sorry, tutors, one of which was Father Sheedy for theology. Father Sheedy said something to Father Hesburgh. Father Sheedy is no longer with us, but he said to Father Hesburgh, the value of life, the, the, what you should do is just show up, just show up. So every time we, Gina and I and my son Andre, Andre, by the way, stand up. He, uh, he suggested the black shamrock for the front of the book. Come on, Andre. Yeah. All right. <laughs> One of my twin sons with his girlfriend, Laura Lee. Just show up. So every time we see Father Hesburgh, we try to see him once a year. He says, you know, David, the value of life is just showing up. And so when I wrote, he asked me, well, his honor, he said, please write something in my book. And I wrote, Father, thanks for showing up. And I also said, Father, every time someone opens this book and reads your foreword to this book, you will show up. No matter where you are, you're going to show up. So that's the Father Hesburgh factor for sure. Well, Professor Page, I want your autograph before you go. Do uh, you have anything you can sign or anything of that nature? Okay. Well, listen, we're honored at this time. We're going to defer to you now, uh, Professor. Professor Yu uh, Page for comments, if you would, on your perception of the current Notre Dame black student experience. Professor Page. The first thing I'd like to do is congratulate both Don and David, the editors of this volume, and all the contributors whose stories are recounted in what is, in my opinion, what they very aptly called a labor of love. Black Domers is a remarkable volume for this and many other reasons. It stands in a long and honored tradition of discourse in the Africana world in which the voices of those who wrestle with and seek to make meaning from the warp and weft of life and of the black experience especially in the various places where it takes shape are recounted. In his now classic work, The Signifying Monkey, Henry Louis Gates Jr. calls attention to the importance of autobiography 
and the trope of the talking book within that genre, as well as to the written word in black literary discourse. Concerning the former, he calls attention to the tendency for black self-referential narratives to honor the tradition of black oral expression and to speak with more than one voice, mirroring to a great extent the character of the Yoruba deity, Eshu. Of the latter, he says the following, and I quote, in the black tradition, writing became the visible sign, the commodity of exchange, the text and technology of reason. Black Domers is such a complex and many-voiced talking book that conjures the heterogeneity of the many experiences and the many ways in which that black experience has been and indeed continues to be in conversation with this university's institutional history and mission as a Catholic institution of higher learning. It also makes us aware that the story of Africana peoples, from Africa, the Americas, the Caribbean, and other overlapping diasporas at Notre Dame is a complex and multifaceted one that continues to be so in 2014. Several of those whose vignettes are featured are faculty and staff members at the university. Others are trustees or emeriti of that governing body. Together, they relate the highs, lows, ambiguities, and conundrums associated with being domers, with being black domers, and the ways they have defined and continue to negotiate that identity. Its entries are varied. Some are third-person retrospective accounts. Others are first-person reminiscences. All speak to build on the editor's metaphor, the language of love. However, this anthology reminds one that those notions of love that have to do simply with romantic attachment have little to do with this book. This book instead has to do with the notion of love that reflects its transformational force, its capacity for endurance, its ability to transcend the difficulties of the moment, and indeed its identity as the indissoluble bond that links all belonging to the Notre Dame family. It is to draw on a West African concept, the ashe, the spiritual force that enables those stories to be seen as texts. Texts speaking lovingly, passionately, and reasonably about life as black domers. It is not a book through which one should hurry. It is not a work to be engaged in a single sitting. It is a book whose communicative modes are varied, whose textures are intricate. It invites one to read between the lines, to imagine the untold episodes and to relive the memories of those who have honored their alma mater with something more valuable than their time, their talent, or their treasure. They have honored it, in fact, with that most timeless and eternal of virtues, truth. Truth as they have viscerally experienced it. They have also shown the strength of their filial bonds to this institution and how Notre Dame became a place where lasting memories, lifelong relationships, and deep friendships, even in the midst of struggle, were forged. Knowing many of those whose stories are in this volume and experiencing firsthand for their regard for all they consider Notre Dame kin, I am reminded of something Zora Neale Hurston says in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road. She says the following, friendship is a mysterious and ocean bottom thing. Who can know the outer ranges of it? Friends, this book is about relationship. This book is about friendship and so much more within the context of a place that all of the contributors consider at once a home 
and a place of diaspora, a temporary physical residence that leaves an indelible mark on the soul of all touched by it. We should celebrate and commend it, not simply as a coffee table volume or item to be placed on student shelves. We should encourage that it be read and discussed by those of us on campus, right here, right now, together. We should encourage students to see in it a model for chronicling, whether in narrative, poetry, music, film, or other appropriate media, their journey here. Those of us who are part of the on-campus community here and now need to listen closely and look intentionally at what these stories reveal about whence we have come, where we are going, and most importantly, who we are called to be as ND. Thank you. Uh, any questions out there? Gina. My, uh, mine is more a comment, oh, and okay. thank you to everyone. Um, I'm one of the contributors. I'm Gina Shropshire, and this book is about history, and I want to introduce someone in the audience, if I may. Um, I wrote about um, one reason I can give back is that my mentor I met here, um, Barbara Lynn, will you stand up for me, please? Um, Thank you. Uh, let me introduce Barbara Lynn Joyner. Um, Lynn, is, Lynn received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Notre Dame in 1957 and his Master's of Fine Arts in 1967. He is truly a pioneer, um, and I wrote about him because what he's given me, I've been allowed to give back to students. So I just wanted to make sure you all know uh, we truly have one of our pioneers here with us today. Right. Thank so thank you. you. Yeah. Other questions? And Lem, we look for you, buddy. We look for you. Right, John? Right. Right. Other comments, questions, anything? A little bit more time here. Or are you so anxious to go get the book? Is that what it is? Okay. Yes, yes please. The, um, the third um, from of that. You know, the third story that you're going to read that you oh, oh I'm it curious was, what your third favorite was. It was that of uh, um, Owen Smith, the um, comedian, and uh, he, he's a writer. Was a writer for the Arsenio Hall show, which I guess doesn't exist anymore, but. Um, he, he said in uh, a humorous way what some other people said in, in a very, I, I can't, I'll try and find let me find it. Oh, I, you got your book. my copy is. Uh, Here I got it, 359. Um, I, was, I was struck in particular by uh, the ending of his piece because, um, as Hugh said, there's a lot of variation in these, in these essays, and people's approaches to things. Something of uh, what Manny hinted at in his statement, you know, not all the black students were happy about his achievement in becoming the first black Irish guardsman. But Owen says here, uh, if you were black at Notre Dame, it meant you had finally found your tribe. And I can't speak for anyone else, but for me, it felt great. It was at Notre Dame where I felt safe enough to dream. I remember taking long walks across that beautiful campus and envisioning myself being a huge star in the world of comedy. I was going to sit on that couch with Arsenio. I was going to have several successful comedy specials, star in movies and television shows, and the world was going to know and love me for making them laugh. Being black at Notre Dame was where I got the courage to dream big. And if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I have not, that was the one. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Um, Dean Page, I'm, I'm curious if you could help us understand from a first year studies perspective or even across curriculum, how Notre Dame is integrating these types of books and these types of te um, testimonies, topics. Um, if you could comment on that, that'd be great. I think uh, one of the things that we are more appreciative of within the classroom is the importance of recognizing the world, the worlds, in fact, that our students come from. And admittedly, the students that we're entering now, that we're allowing to enter the university now, that we're admitting now, come from a world that's much more digitally engaged, where social media of various and sundry kinds is the norm, and where the modes of communication are much more complex than they have been in the past. So simply allowing students to learn by giving them a reading list is no longer enough. Lecturing is no longer enough. So we're experimenting with things like flipped classroom technology. We're thinking about how to employ multiple modes of media in reaching students. And I can speak from personal experience, one of the things that many of us try to do, for example, in the Department of Africana Studies, is encourage students to embrace their own story, not to check their experiences at the classroom door, but to use them as conversation partners to begin interrogating ideas and texts, and to begin to use these learning experiences to know more about themselves. So I see this particular book as being a, a very important model for showing exactly how you can tell your story, how you can access the experiences of others, and use such, uh, such texts as examples that guide your own approach to learning and to making those things that you learn very much your own. Thanks. Yes. Question over here? OK. OK, sure. Yeah, this is Lionel Phillips, and I graduated in the 70s. And there, I, I was wondering, as you guys went through the book, and you, it's kind of a chronicle of the years um, as people attended here, did you notice any type of trend in terms of the, uh, the attitudes that students had about their experiences at Notre Dame early on versus what we are witnessing today? Or is it still just as tough, just as challenging as it was 40 some years ago? Um, well, the one observation that, that came to me as I was editing pieces was that um, those who graduated before 1970 were on the whole far more positive about their Notre Dame experience than those who came afterwards. And I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but it was just a sense that I got. Um, um, and I don't know whether it's because the world was changing, because Notre Dame was changing, and uh, you know it was becoming a less personal, bigger, more factory type place, I don't know. We still, I mean, I have a son who graduated from here in 2010, and um, he seems to have had close personal relationships and things, so maybe, I don't know. Trailblazers. I mean, we. Well, know. thank you. I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but one, of the thing, one of the great things that happened was uh, I kept saying to David throughout the process, you know, we need to get more old timers because, because, you know, a lot of them have passed on. And toward the end, I think it was Ben Fenley and Percy Pierre, a former member, Percy is a former member of the Board of Trustees, uh, an Emer a trustee emeritus, rather, uh, put us in touch with um, Clyde Jupiter, who was a grad student. M many of the black students in the earliest days were graduate students. Um, and a lot of them came from Xavier in, in New Orleans. Um, uh, with Clyde Jupiter and a gentleman named Alton Adams, who's, uh, who are among the oldest contributors. And I thought their, their essays were just particularly, particularly moving. Um, I guess I've always had this reverence for old people and the way they talk and the stories they tell. So I like those. Oh, sure. Um. 
1972, women were, in, were allowed to attend Notre Dame as undergrads. Uh, and in, in the book, there's a, an excerpt about a black woman who got a degree from Notre Dame in like 50, oh, yeah. so can you touch upon that? Yeah, um, her name was Goldie Ivory. Um, she, was a, um, she was a social worker in South Bend and she earned a, a master's degree in sociology, as I recall. She was very well known in the community, worked for a long time in uh, the Elkhart public school system. Um, and uh, she, she uh, came to Notre Dame on a part-time basis, you know, working her way through while she held down a full-time job. She, uh, her husband became unemployed at one point and she thought she'd have to drop out, but she kept plugging away and she became the first black laywoman ever to earn a degree from Notre Dame in 1956, if I recall correctly. No. <laughs> You know, I counted how many women were either uh, profiled, uh, Miss Ivory is our one profile, uh, not deceased, 31 total, essayist or the profile, 31 out of seven, uh, 70, almost half. Uh, Lionel, a theme, a positive theme throughout the book, and I think Don will agree with this, is the effect, the hospitality of the South Bend black community. Yes. And, and that, from Clyde Jupiter all the way up until present. That was a constant theme, and because of that, we're saluting the black community by going to the church uh, on Sunday uh, for a book signing. Yes. Oh, hi, Phyllis Stone. Um, I just have one theory as to why you might see kind of a, a divide between up to the 70s and then afterwards. I, and I think it just simply reflects a sign of the times because you know typically in the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, we were breaking barriers during those years. And, uh, and the world was still black and white in many cases. Um, from the 80s onward, my sense is that, um, you know, once we sort of started to integrate a little bit, I think the world began to think in the 90s that racial problems maybe were behind us or they weren't talked about as much as they had been. And so as a result, you can see some of the students who are writing in the 80s and 90s and the 10s are shocked you know, at some of the things that they run into and don't have maybe the, I guess, the, the resiliency <laughs> or the patience or um, I think the stamina or whatever it took to buck up, you know, as Father Hesper told, told you guys to do. Yeah. So at any rate, that's just my own uh, and, thought you know, about it. It's nice it. to meet you finally. And you're you an too, essayist David. and you're on the board of trustees here yes. at Notre Dame. Correct. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> you know, talking about themes, I don't want to put Mark Wendell on. You were telling me before when we were doing the book signing, your theory about the 70s and Notre Dame students. Could you share that thought? Your pass is back. Uh, thanks for putting me on the spot. Okay. So um, <laughs> what, I, what I was talking to David about was I'm, I'm a, serving on the board. I love the community aspect of the university. I love listening to our board members and, and alumni we come across from the 60s and 70s about you, they mention a name and everybody knows that name. And there's, there was a sense of connection and community no matter what age, race, color, whatever. And, and I was, well, I was an architecture student, so I was, in a, I was in a building all by myself for like five years and no one recognized me, but it seems like when you get in the 90s and 2000s, there's, there's, it becomes a little bit separatist. It becomes a little bit more focused on you knew who was in your dorm, but not across the campus. And I think sometimes maybe that has to do with the growth of the university and it's pulling the connection a little bit away. So that was my thought. Manny, you had something? Yeah, Manny Grace? A campus tour at three that in case people want to go next. I also noticed a, a change in the 1970s, at least in the essays that were in the book. And my thought was 1970s was when the big affirmative action lawsuits were happening. You know, Bakke versus Board of Education, Bakke versus State of Michigan, uh, State of California. And in those cases, for the first time, I think, I mean, the black students who were admitted to Notre Dame up until that time 
were there on their own merits, and, they, and no one thought anything of it. But after the 70s, people, the, I think the white community here at Notre Dame started to wonder, this black classmate next to me, is he here only because of affirmative action? And I, I didn't put this in my book, in my essay, but I had a number of students question why I was there and whether or not I belonged to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that attitude kind of infected a lot of the interpersonal relationships a lot of black students had from the 1970s on. And uh, there was always, a, you know, you had to prove yourself to your classmates besides having to matriculate, besides having to do really well in the school. You also had to prove to somebody else that you belonged here. And that was a kind of a hard feeling for a lot of people to have in the 1970s. Questions. Hi, everybody. Hi, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Jean Collier, class of 83, uh, and I'm representing here tonight the past presidents uh, of the Alumni Association, but I also currently work for the university. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, kind of point out uh, all the lovely ladies of Lewis that are in the room. Uh, Gina Tromshire, um, <laughs> Eleanor Walker, and Phyllis Stone, and I know Jolie Cooper is, uh, yeah, oh, there we go, over there, yeah. But these, and Christina Smith and I were also, we we're all there at the same time. And, you know, Lewis, um, I think, continues to be the largest female dorm on campus. We had over 300 girls, and I had the privilege of being president my junior year. But we also had the largest percentage of African-American uh, women, you know, in that dorm. And uh, a lot of events were held in Lewis, uh, BCAC, Black Cultural Arts uh, Center, and so I just want to thank these women publicly because they are continue to be very close friends uh, with Christina and me. But as somebody said, I think the sense of community is what you know people come to Notre Dame. Whether you come here for that or you get it, you know you end up walking out of it, uh, out of here, um, and you stay connected hopefully for life. But just want to thank you all. And uh, just I'm I'm shocked that I don't have the book in my hands, so I'm embarrassed. I'm going to walk over right now uh, because uh, I need to read this book, and I will meander through it and enjoy it. Uh, for a long time, but uh, amazing project. You, Dr. Page, you continue to just uh, impress you know, the world and, and you're doing such great things for Notre Dame, so I just want to thank you for that too. But thank you, Don. I, I want to thank Dr. Page because uh, anytime something I worked on can be mentioned in the same breath with Zora Neale Hurston and Henry Louis Gates. <laughs> Don, I'd like your impression on uh, you know, Notre Dame being a Catholic university, and for the black pioneers, was that a comfort, a challenge, an individual experience? Um, wow, that's a tough one, because uh, over time, I'm trying to recall now, I think most of the early pioneers uh, were Catholic. They came from Xavier in, in New Orleans and a large black Catholic community in Louisiana and whatnot. Um, uh, however, one of the biggest, uh, uh, greatest of them all and, and the most rah-rah is Tom Hawkins. He was not Catholic. Um, I don't know. Um, um, I, I, think, I think Catholic or not, the fact that Notre Dame was a religious institution and had certain, certain um, commitments to a life of the spirit and the soul, I think that had a big effect in people's lives, um, not just then, but now. Chris, um, who was my roommate, Chris Smith, for one year, being very Catholic, and we had many discussions. I'm not Catholic, very much so, and I commented in my essay about that, but the thing about Notre Dame was the Christianity, the love, the caring, the giving back. I came here expecting, oh my God, I have to take a theology class with Catholics? That was my attitude. And you know, I had a priest from Ireland, so she knows I was not looking forward to that. Well, I got an A in the class, and we always took it out of the class to the cafeteria and continued our discussions because I was not made to feel, oh, you're not Catholic, you're not good enough. It was just that sense of Christianity. I respect your religion. You respect mine. 
We have the same goals. We're out there to help the world and encourage the world. So I want to just comment on that because I'm one of those students. Hi, my name's Michelle Mann. I'm a sophomore in the School of Business. Um, and uh, <laughs> so this is, yep, that was my mom, class of 80. <laughs> she probably wouldn't want me to say. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we've talked a lot about how, you know, there were so many generations of African Americans at Notre Dame who were pioneers and who worked so hard, you know, to make a way for the rest of us. But sometimes it still kind of feels like we're pioneers a little bit. There's still so many moments when we still have to be like individual teachers, you know, like when you're like the one black kid in a class and stuff. Um, and so my question for all of you guys is, what advice do you have for the rest of us who are still continuing to try to pioneer a way for ourselves at Notre Dame? Uh, stay strong, stay a teacher, take every opportunity to make the university a better place. Don and I did it repeatedly. A lot of discussions. I, for one, would provoke the discussion. If they were talking about football, I talked about racism on the campus or something <laughs> more important. Uh, so I think you just be resilient. Keep your grades up, however. And Michelle, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, too. Right. Um, I guess I would refer back to what Dean Page said. You have a story. Everybody has a story. And I'll never forget my very first day on campus here in the fall of 1965. I was walking with another student, um, and he was from Idaho. And he said, uh, you know, I'm the only student here in the class from Idaho. I, I've, I've, you know, I probably wouldn't have gotten in otherwise. <laughs> I kid you not. And, and I, I noted that, and it stayed with me, because anytime somebody says, you know, you just got here because of law, there are all kinds of ways that things cut. And you've got a story. Your story is important here, just like every other story. Tell it. I'd say that... Uh... You always have to remember who you are. You should never not fight the good fight. But you also have to remember that there are times when you have to disengage, when you have to step away and you have to take care of you. My formula for doing that is not your formula for doing that. But my commitment as an administrator is to make sure that you have space to do that. And that's my promise. I want to personally thank each of you for sharing uh, your stories, sharing the book with us, uh, Dean Page for being here with us, and everyone else, especially our Alumni Association board who's in town, who gracing us today with your presence. We appreciate that. And everyone else who joined us today and everyone online. So thank you all, um, and we'll wrap it up. And next week, if you're interested in back on campus for the Michigan game, we have um, the Notre Dame architect, uh, Doug Marsh, here talking about the Campus cross Crossroads Project Explained. So you'll learn all about it. So thank you. Thank you.